Welcome once again. This is the road to recovery, the road to freedom. This is my happy every Friday. Welcome to the road to recovery, the road to freedom with Mark. This is my half hourly slot every Friday when I bring to you a story and I talk a little bit about my pet subject, which is depression. And um, I come into Marston from Pahitur every every Friday and I get time to contemplate about things, to think about what I'm going to say. And today's little five-minute spiel is on friends. Um, the value and the importance of good friends and uh, we often discuss this I was talking to a a mutual friend of ours a while ago Esther and um, I tried to explain to her that at least in my lifetime in half a century (laughs) hard to believe I've probably gathered around me about five really really decent true friends you know people who would take a bullet for you and I tried to explain that if you have just one good friend like that who you can turn to um, who'll lift you up and and you do the same for them that is the difference um, between getting better surviving and um, deteriorating and I'll never forget my good friends Keith and Cherie. Um, on my 50th birthday, they bought me a ticket to go and see a Pink Floyd covers band out in uh, Stonehenge in Gladstone. And it was amazing. It was a wonderful time. I mean, I did want to celebrate my birthday, but I don't want to be a big deal about it. And, and they did this for me. And for just a few short hours, all my troubles and cares just floated away and um, I just had a really great time with my mates at a concert and I'll never forget it and those are the sort of things that uh, they carry you through the hardest of times so special thanks to Keith and Cherie for that and for making a huge difference in my life and you know when the winds of change blow and and they surely will in your lifetime um, the chaff soon gets blown to the four winds. All your acquaintances, the people who you thought were your friends, just vanish, disappear. And only the good ones are left. And really, they're the only ones that are worth holding on to. So that's my piece about friends. On with our show. Today's story is Travels in South Africa. I lived in South Africa for the reign of the last two white presidents, Pitt Botha and F.W. de Klerk. In two and a half years, I travelled down the garden route of the East Coast, back up through the middle to Johannesburg and Pretoria. What struck me in the first few days in Johannesburg was the armed soldiers standing on every corner of every governmental building. I felt great unease at the sight of machine guns in the hands of young men. Racial segregation was still apparent everywhere, from the all-black labouring gangs on building sites to the all-white industries like the legal system. There was a sense of nervousness and civil unrest with the neighbouring Soweto slums splitting at the seams. There were constant reports of killings at rallies and funerals for political radicals. Nelson Mandela was still on Robben Island at the time I arrived, but it was obvious he would soon be released. That would be the catalyst for true democracy and the end of the current apartheid rule. It was obvious the country itself was not ready for all the changes that were about to happen. The five major home states of the black people had no infrastructure, lacking simple things like power and water to homes. They were little more than unsightly slums that were in stark contrast to the rest of the country. All of the country outside these home states had an air of normality, and the main cities cities of each state 
seemed quite successful despite world trade sanctions. Every city had its own version of segregation, with the Afrikaners living in affluent suburbs in Johannesburg, with huge fences around their perimeters. Every fence was solid and topped with broken bottles and razor wire, giving them a typical fortress effect. The other white tribe were the English speakers, who spoke English as a first language and held English passports. They lived in suburbs with lower fences, but bars on every door and window. The two white tribes were segregated in subtle ways in Johannesburg, but the black people were forced to live in neighbouring Soweto, which at the time numbered some five million souls living in poverty. The populations of the white people in each city had a noticeably nicer neighbourhood, and they had better schooling for their kids. That led to better job opportunities for jobs and industries run by their own people. The system was self-supporting, and South Africa is still rich in diamonds and gold. Fortunes extracted from the earth, however, did not translate to an even spread of wealth. At the other end of the scale were 33 black tribes in South Africa, some of which had no real representation in government and suffered terribly as a result. The people of Indian descent were caught in the middle and referred to as coloured. They had some political representation in places like Durban and Natal province. About a quarter of Durban was made up of Indians, and it surprised me to see such large numbers of Indians. In nearby Ladysmith, their famous son Mahatma Gandhi worked as a lawyer before becoming famous for his peace protesting and political career. Despite some influence, they lived as second-class citizens and tended to live mainly along the east coast. In Durban there are some 11 kilometres of beautiful coastline with wonderful beaches all the way round. In the middle of the wealthiest section of the Strip were two beautiful skyscrapers, the Maharani and the Elangini. One had a glass lift up the outside of the building to a nightclub at the top. Despite its political isolation, places like Durban with its massive port managed to thrive. Apartheid had a weaker hold on the population of Durban as opposed to Pretoria and Johannesburg. It seemed to lessen as we headed south and away from the spiritual and political homeland of the Afrikaners. So it seemed to hold true as we pulled into Cape Town with its incredible Table Mountain and Lion Rock. Cape Town itself seemed far more at ease with itself with far less obvious segregation. We booked ourselves an apartment in the Green Lane area of the Cape and returned to take the gondola ride up Table Mountain, which is a flat plateau. The view from the top was simply breathtaking, as the mountain offered a 180-degree panoramic view. It felt like God's window on the world from up there and reminded me of the Drakensberg Ranges with its spectacular views over the city below. No matter which direction you look at in this beautiful city, Table Mountain dominates with its awe-inspiring presence. Cape Town had some decent nightlife as well. We found a place called the Pig and Whistle, which was a great place for a feed, then drink and dance to a local rock band. We had a great time there, drinking and dancing on tables, as was the custom there. There was a noticeable lessening of segregation here too, with all races allowed on the same buses and some of the same beaches. Even so, there was talk of the local Cape Malay people suffering poverty and squatter camps springing up on the outskirts of town. In all our travels around Southern Africa, Cape Town was the, probably the most relaxed and free from the political plague that apartheid had become. Its great beauty is icing on the cake, and it is a place that stays long in the memory, as it must raise as one of the most beautiful cities in the world. Altogether too soon, we headed up country from Cape Town onto Stalinbosch, 
through the Little and Great Karoo to Kimberley. The famous diamond mining town features a one kilometre hole in the ground and the area still produces diamonds to this day. The area also features some particularly fine vineyards and we were treated to some wonderful wine. Even so, there was a marked difference in the political situation as we drove up north. By the time we reached the Orange Free State, we were back in the old South Africa we had witnessed in Pretoria and Johannesburg. It was strange to witness the different versions of apartheid in the one place. All of the country was in a state of permanent change, like it or not. The last two successive white governments realised they were little more than night watchmen, waiting for the new South Africa to be born. They mainly concerned themselves with trying to keep law and order and stopping the country from spiralling into war, as so many of its neighbours had done. All right, we'll take a little bit of a break there and I will play you some 660. Start of my demise 
Welcome back. I love that sentiment. They come, they go, but you know, I know, this is forever. Right. On with today's story, Travels in South Africa. One of the more interesting little adventures happened in Durban when we went to the Curry Cup Rugby Finals. Standing out as Kiwis meant we met plenty of people interested in our journey and our impressions of the country. They were wonderful hosts, and one guy, David, offered to introduce us to a rugby-mad friend, Arpy Kitchen, who lived with his family under a local stadium. He took us from Kings Park to Park's Rugby Club to meet Arpy, who immediately asked the four of us to stay with him and meet some of his friends. Arpy, who was Afrikaans, and his wife, an English speaker, were wonderful hosts and lived in an amazing flat built under the stadium Arpy looked after. We stayed for a few days before Arpy took us out to the countryside to Potenzi to meet some friends who grew oranges for a living. We didn't know what to expect and were amazed to see orchards as far as the eye could see in a valley serviced by a huge dam they had built for themselves. We were taken to the homestead of Zol Ferreira, a descendant of Portuguese and Afrikaans, who had carved out an oasis for themselves in very harsh land. As well as oranges, Zol had an ostrich farm for extra income. Another relative and neighbour kept antelopes for local consumption and local braai feasts or barbecue feasts held for all the local folks. The first day and night we stayed there, Zol turned on one of these massive feasts for the four of us. All of the neighbours from miles around came over to meet us, and it turned out most of them were related. They lived in their valley pretty isolated from the rest of the country in a small microcosm of South Africa. Whilst there, we met a relative, Espy Ferreira, the richest of the orchardists, who invited us to come over and visit. He owned a massive orchard in the middle of the valley, along with the local packing sheds, the bottle store, and a few other shops in the small village he and his ancestors had built. He also had many black folks working for him, and their families lived on his land in very primitive conditions. The orchardists there could not see why the black workers should live any differently, despite the massive contrasts in their lives. Even so, the orchardists were heavily armed in case of civil uprising. They were very isolated in Potenzing, and almost all of them belonged to the Dutch Reformed Church and are staunch believers. We stayed at Zolferera's place as they had plenty of room with servants to help run the place. It was very strange for me to be waited on by maids, but they seemed very happy with their situation. There was also plenty of land and hills to explore, and on the third night there, we headed up the back of the property to catch some live game. The idea was to spotlight the antelope using utes, then to herd them up and jump off the back of the utes and rugby tackle them and tie them up. It was a dangerous exercise jumping off the back of utes at some speed, so it was left for the black folks to do. I joined up with them in the back of the ute and soon we were jumping out to tackle the poor panicking antelope. A few guys got quite badly banged up and we managed to capture three female buck which were trussed up and transported to a local farm. I was surprised that everyone took their situation in life without question or complaint, but that was how they had grown up, and they had never known any different. Even so, it was difficult to talk to the black folks living in Potenzing, as they did not want to offend the white orchardists who employed them. It seemed there was little option for them, and schooling was a luxury not afforded them. I felt sad for them, as I could not see that any form of democracy would change their lot. 
This was the case in much of South Africa, and no magic wand of political change would free people from their predestined place in society. The black people living in Potenzin seemed to care little for the changes about to happen, and it was obvious that significant change would happen a generation at a time. It had to start with literacy and political awareness before any significant change could take place. As far as the orchardists were concerned, they had carved out this piece of paradise with their own hands and could not see any reason for change. They were worried that the future would bring change to their well-ordered society and the country would fall into chaos. They had already watched as Angola, Mozambique, Northern and Southern Rhodesia had gone through civil war and fallen into rack and ruin. They did not believe that Mandela could bring change without civil uprising, and the affairs seemed well-founded. They did not, however, see anything wrong with the existing system as it offered stability and certainty. In the end, however, it was a numbers game, and when everyone in the country was granted a vote, their point of view would be swept aside in a wave of change. Our hosts were really decent people who could not do enough for us, so I felt sorry for them as well as they faced a world of change. The future was uncertain, but everyone hoped it would spell the ends of political sanctions and allow South Africa to join the rest of the free world. I was surprised at the Africans' resilience despite being in the political wilderness. For all of its troubles, it was easily the most sophisticated and robust of the countries we visited in Southern Africa. That resilience gave me hope that they would find a way to cope with the change about to come. After a wonderful and enlightening stay at Potenzing, it was altogether too soon that we had to say goodbye. The valley really was a microcosm of South Africa itself, with an uncertain future but the potential to grow and flourish with new change. In the many years since I visited South Africa, the ANC's Mandela government came and went. It did not deliver the hoped-for change, but to me was astonishing for the lack of bloodshed. The Mandela government was able to convey the message of hope, and especially forgiveness. This stopped the country from descending into civil war and allowed a smoother transition from white to majority rule. I was surprised at the lack of civil unrest and hoped this peaceful beginning would lead to a prosperous future. Unfortunately, this was too much to expect as South Africa was very set in its ways and not all change could happen quickly. Many people hoped for immediate change, whereas real and meaningful change will more likely take generations. I think the Mandela years delivered all it was capable of. I hope the future will bring the freedoms all of South Africa's people yearn for. I believe it is now up to all of the countries who placed embargoes and sanctions to deliver on promises of acceptance and open trade. I expect, however, South Africa will take a long time to recover, and I feel sorry for all those wonderful people I met on my journeys. I look back now on that journey with a melancholy heart, as it is a place where I felt I left a little piece of myself. I will never forget the promise of the burning sunrise and the incredible red sunsets of a place I came to love. I hope for her a better future. And that is my story of South Africa, right? I hope you enjoyed it. Look at that, bang on, 28 minutes. That's my piece for this week, so thank you very much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed it. I love doing this stuff, and uh, I'm looking forward to next week. In the meantime, if you know someone who's suffering from depression... Be that difference maker and you never know, you, you just might save a life. So, um, yeah, thanks. We'll catch you again next week. Bye for now.
You're gonna be taken, babe Walk in the street like a superstar The crazy things you'll see Watch your feeling on this time of change See all around
Kau 
Yeah. Chong Ni. Let's go. She was 17. With a body in motion that moves like a finely tuned machine. Hypnotizing man is what she does best like a gypsy queen. With a tight black dress on the chrome that's slick like a limousine. In between, and all she's got is money on her side. I know you like it when she dances, takes that money from your man. If you think you're there for love, oh boy, I don't think so, dog. She's the master of her game, 'cause she wants to know her name. I bet you think right now you rock. Oh boy, I don't think so. so. Hey, I'm easy, man. Are you sure we don't know this girl, cuz? Man, I'm sure we seen it somewhere, man. Oh, uh, hot damn, man. I'm sure we seen it on tour, man. Damn. Hey, don't need you to talk to her for a minute, man. All day to day. It's the same old thing with the same old man in every way. Think you back to sing the road she thought you'd never play. But with money on your mind, I guess these things. Will never change. Ain't that a shame? So you've gone and wasted all my time. I know you like it when she dances, takes that money from your man. If you think you're there for love, oh boy, I don't think so, dog. She's the master of her game, 'cause she wants to know her name. What's her name, dog? You think right now you rock. Oh boy, I don't think so. so. Yeah. Hey, I'm easy, man. Don't we know this girl from somewhere, man? Are you lying, dog? Nah, nah, dog. I'm sure we seen this girl on tour somewhere, man. I'm, I'm sure I seen her somewhere, dog. I'm saying, man. Hey, I want to talk to him, man. Dog. I used to play pool with her, you know, fool with her. I'm still cool with her, yeah. I holla when she see me in the club. She always pop my collar. She like, hang out, daddy. Where you been? I'm like, I just got off a plane, girl. I just got in. My flight landing on. My game just rewind. I'm stripped up, pimped up, and ready. What? Yeah. Hey, on easy, man. Ain't sure we don't know this girl, man. I'm sure we seen her somewhere, cuz. Damn. Yeah. You know we back for that 06. My man Chong Ni taking over this year, baby. What? Hey, baby. It's the 